Thank you. Thank you. This was um, uh, how to get things done with, elected, with New York State Legislature, but I'm expanding it to just elected officials. Because how many of you are not from New York? Okay. So some of this stuff is the same. Actually, most of it's the same. Um, dealing with elected officials is just about how your processes work, but basically it's all the same. So the, the New York State Animal Protection Federation is a statewide organization. It was founded in 2010. Um, and we have one of the founding members here, Barbara Carr. She was the uh, executive director of uh, the SPCA serving in Erie County. We represent all the shelters across the state. Um, when I started, we had 10 members. We now have 55, over 55. Um, we've grown exponentially, um, and it's been a, a, a good thing. So for those shelters, for those people who are at shelters who um, are in New York and are not members, you need to join. Okay? There are a lot of members. In, huh? Yeah, right. There are a lot of, right, right, right. There are a lot of members in the room. Um, why don't you just raise your hands, the members that are here? Oh, good. So if you want to talk to people, that would be great. Okay. We also have a C4, uh, 501C. We're a C4. Okay. So we can educate, we ad advocate, and we lobby. I lobby. I'm one of those dreaded people called a lobbyist. Okay. I lobby the New York State Legislature, uh, the Executive Chamber which is the governor's office and the Department of Agriculture, Ag and Markets, Agriculture and Markets, which is the department in New York State that oversees the shelters. Okay? So here's the map. We have a, my intern did a Google map for me. I didn't know what to do, and he did it. It was a wonderful thing, um, and it shows where we are. Um, we have some pockets of the state that we don't have members, like up here, and uh, oh, Ithaca. And a little Syracuse, Utica area, but the Utica area is going to get taken care of soon. But, um, um, but we're, we're growing our membership. Okay? We also have a 501c3, which is our nonprofit tax deductible arm of the Fed. And that was formed uh, to do professional development, industry education. We do a lot of consulting. Barbara Carr, who's here with us today, uh, does shelter uh, consulting in terms of how to make your shelter better how to prepare for a new building, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so we do that. Um, I can do board training and help you with development. Um, and we have low-cost grant writers for those shelters who are looking to apply for the money from the Companion Animal Capital Fund. We have low-cost grant writers accessible to just our members to be able to do that. Because if you do it with a grant writer, you're more likely to get funding, if not. Okay? Okay. And we also work with all the animal cruelty folks in the state, the ACOs, the DCOs, the Humane Law Enforcement. Uh, no one was representing them at all. Nobody was representing their interests. So now we are doing that. And we've done some really fun stuff. And I worked with the District Attorneys Association of New York State to create an animal crimes task force. So if you are in upstate New York in a rural area and your district attorney doesn't give to anything, since it's being taped, so I have to be nice, but don't care about animal crimes, you now have a place to go within the District Attorneys Association with two really good people, Jed Painter from Nassau County and Jen McCanny from Albany County, who will talk to your district attorney and tell them what to do in a nice way. If I talked to them, I would tell them what to do in not a nice way. Okay. So we have an animal law app. It's being redone right at this very moment, actually, and it will probably be ready to relaunch in uh, August of 2019. It'll be available on Google Play and the App Store. It has all the animal laws of New York State on the app. One of the things that law enforcement will tell you, uh, like your police, oh, I don't know what the animal laws are because it doesn't come with the gray book. The gray book is McKinney's The Penal Code. Animal laws are on, in the ag and markets law. They're not in the penal code. So we've made this available so that they would have the law at their fingertips and they can't make that excuse anymore. Okay? And that's sponsored by our sheriff, Craig Apple, in Albany County, who's a great animal lover, as well as our district attorney, who also loves animals. Okay. So why become politically engaged? Okay? This is what people used to think of lobbyists. You know, fat cat lobbyists chomping on cigars. I couldn't find fat cats chomping on cigars, but I thought these dogs really did the trick. They all sort of look like Teddy Roosevelt in a top hat. Okay? You know, um, and if this is what you think of who we are, to some degree, 
In some circles, you're right. But the majority of us that are doing this work are not well-heeled fat cat lobbyists. Okay? We're people like me who are really dedicated to our issues, whatever those issues um, might be. So instead of calling it lobbying, let's call it advocacy. Doesn't that sound nicer? Right? Sounds a lot nicer. Okay? But it's the only way to get anything done. It's the only way to get policy changed. You have to go to your elected officials to get policy change. The other way to get policy change is to vote them out and vote in good people who will do it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and I do that kind of work too. But, you know, right now we're talking about advocacy. It's the only way to get policy change. You can build relationships with people. And that's what it, this is all about. It's about relationship building. When you're doing lobbying, when you're doing advocacy, you need to know who your people are. You need to have a relationship with them. You want to become an asset for your elected officials. When Stacey Haynes over here, she was the Susquehanna SPCA, one of the first shelters to get money from the Companion Animal Capital Fund. Jim Seward, who is her state senator, was there the next day to get his picture taken with her. Okay? It's about becoming an asset for your elected officials. Okay? And it's figuring out ways to do that. And you get to organize your community of supporters. You get to become a leader. And I don't think there's anything better than that. I love leading people. I love doing this kind of work. Um, you get to become a leader. And it's a lot of fun. It really is. It can be very frustrating. You're dealing with elected officials. But nonetheless, and it's slow moving. It's sort of like molasses at times. But you do get things done if you stay with it. So there's all kinds of advocacy. There's lobbying at the state level. And you can do it at the Capitol, right? You can come for Advocacy Day, which is the first Monday in March. We give you training. We tell you what to do, blah, 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 blah. Or you can do it in district. And let me tell you, doing it in district is incredibly effective. Number one, they don't expect people to come see them in their district offices. Number two, and this goes for any state legislature, except maybe, I don't know, the ones that don't have offices, like some of the ones in New, up in, uh, New England. But by and large, the legislative ca offices, the capital offices, they're big. they are got a big red leather chair. they got a big desk. they got all the pen certificates of all the laws they've passed up on the walls. It's set up to be intimidating. That's not the way it is at, the, in, at their district offices. And so I'm a firm believer in in-district lobbying as well. And locally, it's about your local elected officials, your mayors, your city council members, your town supervisors, your town council, whoever those county legislators, whoever those folks are. Lobbying, uh, advocacy is also about public education. Now, you are mostly 501c3s, right? You can educate the public on these issues all day long. You're not asking anybody to vote yes or no. You're not asking anybody to vote for a candidate, which you are totally forbidden to do. You cannot get engaged in electoral politics as a 501c3. But you can educate the public about the issues. You can tell them what they can do to impact those issues. And boy, what do they think you're going to say? Tell the legislator to vote against this bill? I don't think so. Okay? And you can do electoral, electoral work which means working for candidates. Who's worked on political campaigns? Okay, do you like it? What I used to do full time, now I get to do it part time with this work, which is great. And you're in New York? I'm in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah, so I'm currently running a judge race now in Delaware County, but I'm full time. I am the executive director of the Center for Animal Health and Welfare, so I get the best of both worlds. I'm a political consultant, too. We should I, chat. I was going to say Okay, that. fine. <laughs> I, just, I just got... With everything you're saying, you're yeah. doing... Yeah, I just got three judges elected. So, and in Albany, everything's a primary because it's all democratic. So, someone else was going to raise their hands? Nope. Okay. So, doing electoral work can be fun. You know, you're, if you're getting behind somebody you like and you get them, hopefully, get them elected. And then there's PAC activity, Political Action Committee. Okay, there are two uh, animal political action committees in the, in the state. There's um, animal. Uh, One's based in New York City, one's based in upstate. And the one in New York City is much more effective uh, than the one um, based out of upstate New York. Um, and, and I've been toying with the idea of doing one for the Fed, um, and we might do one down, down the line. But there's all kinds of advocacy, and you just need to embrace what it is that you want. And now our advocacy works really well. It works really well. So you see we have all these members. 
we get them to get engaged for the most part in the advocacy efforts. They get to come to Albany. They get to go and do in-district lobbying. They get to get engaged with whatever it is that we need them to get engaged with, and I'll tell you how we do that. So I make sure that every member knows who their elected officials are. I can take care of the state. You guys have to take care of the local, but it's about making sure you know who they are, how to contact them, okay? About creating that relationship. Relationships are really important. Relationships is how we get things done, okay? If I didn't have a relationship with somebody here, I wouldn't be talking to you today, okay? So relationships are really important and you should think about how you can build relationships with your elected officials, right? As I said, making it an asset is really important. Making your shelter an asset to them. There are two rules to elected officials. Getting elected, getting reelected. <laughs> okay? Those are the two rules to elected officials. So how can you help them as long as they're going to help you, you know, not get reelected because you can't do that, but just be able to have their face their name associated with the shelter, which everybody loves because nobody hates puppies and kittens for the, for the most part. So there's photo ops. You can provide them with information, opportunities for them to show how much they support the shelter. Okay? You, if you have a big signature event every year, make sure they get invited. Make sure they come. Make sure they're introduced. Make sure they give out an award. You know, give them a role to play. Make sure that they feel appreciated. They have massive egos, which needs to be stroked all the time, okay? And just play into that for your benefit. Not for their benefit, but for your benefit. So one of the things we do on a local level is occasionally we get involved with stuff. And a few months ago, the city council in Norwich, there's a cat problem in Norwich. Norwich is in the southern tier between Oneonta and Binghamton somewhere. I, I drove there, so I know it's somewhere out there. And they wanted to ban the feral cats. They wanted to ban the feeding of feral cats. And so I read this in the newspaper, because I have a Google alert that says all kinds of things in animal stuff. And I read this, and I called Erin Insigna, who's the, uh, uh, the director at the um, Delaware Valley Humane Society. I said, are you getting involved in this? She's like, yeah, we're involved. I said, I'm going to come. So she was all excited. So we went out. And she spoke first. She's the first person up there, and then I'm standing behind her. And then I spoke. And then a whole bunch of other people spoke. And only two or three people spoke in favor of the ban. And they, it, we stopped them in their tracks. So this local stuff, you can get things done on a local level. It's about organizing people and getting people to speak out. Okay? So we stopped that measure in its tracks. I've done some other work on a local level with various folks as well if I get the call and I'm more than willing to do it. So on a, on a statewide level, I'm using our examples of what we've done to show you what's possible, okay? Um, my goal for the 2020 session is to have every shelter, every member, have a public affairs committee. And that's a committee of people. It, do, it can be a board member with volunteers, okay? People who are going to make sure that the shelter is engaged in these issues and that, that they reach, the shelter reaches out to its email list, its volunteers, its donors to get them engaged. It's a model that has worked very well across the country for lots of different organizations and it's one of the things that I'd like to have happen here. So they'd be responsible for signing people up. Um, and uh, they could sign them up as advocates for us. So there's nothing, no engagements listed because the session is over. Um, but this does give you some information about some bills. But here's where you can look up who your legislators are and where you can join our advocacy network. And when you click here, you put your name, your address, and please click opt-in. Please, 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 because if you don't, then you just get active for this particular engagement, this one engagement you signed up for, but then I can't email you again. So we want folks to get engaged. We want the shelters to send out emails with this information and the link for people, do social media, meetings, all that sort of stuff. And then for you all to share it on your social feed. I, I, we have a very active Facebook page, and I put stuff out there, and I boost it to people 
who like our page and their friends. I don't boast it all over the state. I boost it, and we always get a good response. Okay, we get a very, very good response. There's letters to the editor, op-eds, media outreach. Media is very important, okay? I'm a firm believer in op-eds. Op-eds are the longer opinion pieces in a newspaper. It's what the community opinion leaders read. So if you want to reach your elected officials, if you want to reach the head of Rotary or the chamber, the head of the hospital, the people you want to bring in to your sphere so, so that they support you, that's one of the ways to do it, besides sitting down and talking to them, okay? So, one of our biggest victories is the Companion Animal Capital Fund. I proposed to the legislature that they put in $5 million in the state budget to help shelters with capital projects. It's not operating. We're not going to be able to get operating money. It's just the political reality of it. But capital is always available because our great-great-grandchildren will be paying for it. Okay? It's just the way it is. Everyone thought I was nuts. But I do a lot of work with libraries, and they had a library construction fund. I'm like, well, why can't we do this with shelters? Mm -hmm. So I went to the right people, and we were able to get it done in the 2017-18 budget, the 18-19 budget. So it was the right sponsors. Deborah Glick in the Assembly, who I've known for decades. And she's, a de she's a Democrat. In the Senate, when it was still under Republican control, a guy named Phil Boyle, who's a big animal advocate. Yep. Is it local? Is this a, a state, just for state, or is this for, can anybody apply to that? Shelters in the state of New York can apply. New just New York, yes. The New York taxpayers are not going to pay for, for, for your shelters, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, they have to have either be a municipal shelter or have municipal contracts, um, uh, and we're trying to rectify that. But anyway. So we had the right sponsors. Every year I do a capital needs survey to find out. So I can, I'm not like just blowing smoke saying, oh, we would need this money, and I can't say, oh, how much people need. Okay. We constantly meet with legislative staff and leadership. On Advocacy Day, which is the first Monday of March, we focus on the budget ask, also other substantive issues, but it's really about the budget ask. And then we emailed, uh, we do email advocacy coupled with the uh, Facebook outreach so that the legislators were getting the emails at their offices. Do they read them? No. It's a counting game. It's about how many come in. Just like phone calls. Just like every, uh, uh, everything else except a handwritten letter will be paid attention to, as will a visit. Okay? But the emails, it's just a counting game. And they do count. Oh, we got this many on this side of the issue, and we got this many on that side of the issue. In 2017, 2018, the fund enjoyed widespread bipartisan support. It was seen as a legislative priority for both houses. I ran into the Secretary of the Ways and Means Committee to thank him, and he said, oh, God, we love this money and the library money because it's feel-good money. What can, what can be bad, right? Um, and as I said before, when the awards got made, the legislators were there in a heartbeat to get their pictures taken. Over the, those two years, 25 shelters were awarded grants. The RFP process is overseen by Ag and Markets. There's a rigorous review of those <laughs> RFPs, of those um, uh, applications. And we're still working to get shelters without municipal contracts parity in the process. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. So. This year, those of us who are in New York and pay attention, the state Senate was taken over by the Democrats. It was part of the blue wave. It is a generational shift. The Republicans will not take control of the Senate again in my lifetime, unless things really get screwed up. But they did that once, and they learned from that. Okay, so it really, but it's a 40 seat margin. It's not like it used to be two seats. It's 40 seats out of 61 that they have. So just because the House, the Assembly is Democratic control, and the Senate and the governor, you know, it's all blue in New York, doesn't mean that they like each other or that it's like, you know, fun time at the OK Corral, OK? They battle it out, and they argue. And everybody know Amazon? And the Amazon deal that didn't happen in New York, well, that played into the entire legislative session and how 
the governor treated the state senate, okay, because it was the senate that put the skids, put that deal on the skids. And so when they did the capital budget, which is where our money was, it was only the governor's capital projects that were funded and not the legislative ads, and we were a legislative ad. So the budget gets passed. I look in the paper, and, and I, see, I look at the budget language, and I like had a fit, and I started calling everybody, and um, it was like, this is the political reality of the situation. Because I was told, like, Friday, oh, we're done. We're fine. No problem. And then Sunday, it's gone. Okay? So we had to work all session to make sure that there was a capital budget. We did this annual capital needs survey. It was over $62 million in the state for capital projects. And that includes New York City. So that adds a big chunk to it because they are doing a new uh, shelter in the Bronx. But I don't care. I really don't care. OK? So we, did, we asked the question, what shape is your present building in? And look at that. Over 40% said they need an improvement. OK? These are the kinds of things that your legislators and your elected officials want to hear. They want, you need to give them some facts. In, it can't all be emotion. You, it's an emotion, it's, a, it's what I call the emotion logic sandwich. Emotion, we have to take care of the puppies and kittens. Logic, these are our needs, this is why, blah, blah, blah. We have to take care of the puppies and kittens. <laughs> okay? And nobody wants to say no to that. And, and you use cute photos. I mean, you know, you use cute photos. You do that. You, get, you pull them by their, their heartstrings. Okay? So nobody was sure if there was going to be a supplemental capital budget. We kept meeting with people over and over and over again. We were also meeting on the pet sales ban. Every time we had a meeting, and we had a lot of those meetings, I would say, oh, by the way, don't forget about the Ca Companion Animal Capital Fund. Please have your member speak out for it in conference, which is the decision-making time. Okay? So what we ended up happening? was we ended up on everyone's list as a priority. The governor's list, the Senate's list, the assembly's list. And it was, it was in the final bill, which is called the thin ugly. It's usually called the big ugly because they dump everything in. There wasn't that much to dump in, so it was sort of thinner than usual. So um, it was the thin ugly, but our money was in there. And we were one of just a handful of legislative ad that made it. So we, were, we did a good job. All of you did a great job if you were involved in this, making sure your legislators knew. But this is the kind of work that it takes to get things changed on a policy level. The RFPs for the new money will be out in August. And the awards will be made December? We'll decide December. December. When it gets out, right, in January or February. Okay. So some other legislative victories that we've had, the shelter rescue registration for all of you who are in New York, are you all registered? Yes? Yes, it's $100. You all had to register. And rescues have to register. And we had the, re how many of you here are rescues? Okay. We had the rescues register because there were pet dealers in the state of New York who were letting their licenses expire they would f become 501c3s as a rescue and use the exact same business model. And we want to cut that out, OK? And so we, we, we got this bill passed. And of course, the governor, the governor took full credit for it. There's probably sound. But he d they do these great little things. When the Companion Animal Capital Fund came out, you would think it was his idea. They did the same sort of thing. And this is a 30 second thing. It's very cute, you know. Um, it, made the, it made the point, but he took total credit for it, which is, you know, and I think, you know, they steal all the cute animal videos from this, the web. Okay? So he signed the bill. It was, very, it was really good. How many of you knew you could lease pets in the state of New York? Like TVs and sofas and that kind of stuff. One year, the year that we were doing this, um, you were at Lobby Day that year, we were doing the budget, and then I said, talk to them about this. Everyone was shocked that you could do this. Shocked, I tell you, that there was gambling going on in this establishment. So we nobody... Pennsylvania, 
Good, good. Because it's got, it's got to stop. Um, and the one place that was doing it in Buffalo has gone out of business. He, he, was, he was leasing chicks at Easter time. Dyed chicks. Dyed chicks. Not dead chicks, but chicks that were dyed. Okay? So that's been done away with. That was an easy bill to do. Everyone was so outraged, it was like, it was done. Rehoming cats. How many of you have cats in your shelters? Okay, all of you. You can now go to your local municipality. I would suggest you do it on the county level. Get them to pass an ordinance saying that you only have to hold them for three days to cut down the hold times. We tried to get it done the other way where the state was saying you don't have to do it, but they wanted it to be a preemptive thing and have the lo localities do it, and we were fine. Buffalo's done it. A couple of other localities have done it as well. And, you know, it was not easy. Because the guy, this guy Bob Stern, who's the head of the Ag Committee, the lawyers, the council, um, was like, well, what about the little old lady next door whose cat gets out? I'm like, microchip the cat, <laughs> right? Well, you know, I'm sort of like, no, there is no well you know. And so they were all concerned about that. Um, so it took, it, it, we were able to get around it by doing it the way we've done. But 4% of all cats that come into shelters are reclaimed and usually within 48 hours. That's it. That's the, the numbers that we get out of PetPoint. So that's, that's it. So, okay. We also do work with the peace officers, as I told you, and in New York. How many of you have peace officers that work with you? You guys do. In New York, um, you have to live in the county where the uh, facility is. Um, and so we got for Hudson Valley Humane Society and Mohawk Hudson Humane Society that their peace officers could come from a, a larger catchment area uh, of counties contiguous and for Albany across the river. Okay. Now, the other part of doing this kind of work is stopping bad bills. And it's easier to stop a bad bill than to get a good bill passed. But it's not as much fun and it's not as sexy. Okay. Um, because I don't get to order a pen certificate for the bills that didn't get passed. So the governor in his budget, when he dropped his budget, the original budget, had a provision in there to make peace officers get pistol permits. And for those SPCA peace officers who carry pistols in the state, and not all of them do, it would have been onerous. It could have meant, you know, it would have been $200 a pop, it could have meant waiting two years. Um, and if you do have a pistol permit, you then can't do your job. You can only do your job in, in the county that you're in. Okay? And when you're on Long Island and doing this work, it takes you into New York City. It takes you, if you're in Nassau County, into Suffolk. You know, there's all different kinds of things. So we got that out of the, of the budget proposal, and it didn't, uh, and it didn't come back up. And then there was a bill to mandate shelter reporting, which on the surface sounds like, why wouldn't we want to report our numbers, right? This comes out of the, the uh, they call it the Companion Animal Protection Act. It comes out of the shelters are bad groups of people. Shelters are the enemy. Shelters only kill. Shelters are horrible, okay? And that's where this piece of legislation came out of. We were not consulted at all about this bill. The bill was put in by a new senator who claims to be an animal advocate from Suffolk County. And um, I wrote a very pointed two-page memo, and um, it got, the bill got shelved. Um, but th this is the kind of stuff that does happen, because the way these numbers were going to be reported was going to make the shelters look bad, because it was about euthanasia. So as an example, Linda Prusky, who's sitting at our tables from uh, the Allegheny SPCA, she gets like farm animals in and other kinds, all kinds of rescue stuff. Sometimes these animals are sick. Sometimes you have to put them down. And so that impacts the euthanasia numbers, and it makes it, the shelter look bad. Okay? And we want to do everything we can to make sure that the shelters don't look bad. Pet sale ban. Okay? The pet sales ban is to stop the sale of puppies, kittens, and rabbits in pet stores. We introduced it this year. 
we thought we might get it this year, but it was, you know, a big lift. Remember I talked about Amazon? Okay, so Amazon, all the Democrats, the newly, newly elected Democrats in the state Senate um, from Long Island, they all wanted Amazon to happen because they saw it as jobs, right? It didn't happen. And then um, the Senate leadership made them vote for the bill to give undocumented immigrants, undocumented immigrants driver's licenses. And then we got to this. And those Long Island Democrat, Democrats were like, oh my God, would you stop it already making us do this left-wing stuff because I'm from Long Island and I'm from Long Island. That's not where our politics are. And so the pet sales ban was shelved for the year. The other thing is, is that that same legislator who says she's a great animal advocate and is chair of the, the new Domestic Animal Welfare Committee kept coming back to us with, well, why shouldn't people be able to buy dogs in pet stores? It's consumer choice. She was listening to the pet industry. It was unbelievable what we were hearing out of her. So we are starting a major campaign us, HSUS, and the ASPCA will be doing a major campaign next year, this coming fall and into next legislative session, to try to get this passed. It's a $76 billion industry. 2% comes from the sale of pets. The other issue is most of those pet stores are on Long Island and New York, and in New York City. And so that's where the pushback. My thing is it gives people the opportunity to rebrand as humane businesses. There is a pet store in, the, in Elmira who realized what they were doing and decided to stop selling pets and just sell supplies and stuff like that. What I kept saying and what I will continue to say is all the shelters in the state of New York standing at the phones ready for the pet store to call for us to come in and do adoption events because the only way, this bill is really specific, the only way they're going to be able to have puppies, kittens, or rabbits in their stores are through adoption events held by you guys. No money changes hands. You don't pay rent, okay? They don't pay you unless they want to give you a, a contribution. But the original bill made sh the shelters into pet dealers, and I said, no way. We're not doing that. And so the bill as it's written now is better for shelters, okay? And, um, and will hopefully uh, get passed. But you all have to be ready to be able to go into these pet stores and do the adoption events. So my tagline in all of this was only pet stores choose to buy puppies from puppy mills. Because that's what this bill will do. It will stop the flow of puppy mill puppies into New York. It's a travesty. I mean, you know, we're not talking about, and we are not talking about backyard breeders or responsible breeders. We're not talking about those folks at all. This is the puppy mills. The people in Ohio, Hunt is the name of it, and other big, big, big breeders where do pet stores go online and say, oh, I want a Shih Tzu and I want a Pomeranian and I want this, and it, it's delivered the next day. And these dogs are bred and bred and bred, and they're kept in cages, one on top of the other, and they're wire cages. So if you're on the top, and you're pooping, it goes all the way down to the bottom. It's really pretty disgusting. Okay, so what can you do? How many of you are now, after I'm done talking about all, all of this, are actually interested in be getting involved in advocacy? Okay, why? Why? Why up there? Just a different way to kind of funnel my So it's a way to funnel your passion. Okay. Again, going backwards, I spent a lot of my time in politics realizing that I had a gift. However, rescue and animal welfare is actually my passion, so now I get to put the two together. So you're combining your professional skills, which is political consulting and advocacy, with your passion. Like, with our shelter, like, not to go back and tell our people about it. 
Okay. Okay, so this is about bringing this message back to your shelters. I have to repeat this because. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this is about um, bringing the message of advocacy back to your shelter. Yeah, just like seeing the benefit that this has for like our counties and stuff. Great. Who else? Yep. So, so helping giving volunteers a better outlet to, to uh, to, for the, to be involved without without having to take every single animal home with them. So, okay. So, being more proactive to prevent problems in shelters. Yep. And looking at the antiquated, I mean, there's a lot of laws that are out there that are just antiquated, you know, and it's, it's people aren't looking at this stuff again and again, and cats in particular have very little, mm -hmm. none, Pennsylvania is really tough <laughs> with the cats. They, they actually either have good laws or none at, none all. at all. Yeah. So like we have Victoria's law now, which is the pet store thing, which is great, it's almost getting ready to go, but yet we have no laws pretty much on cats. Nothing. So there's yeah. like, except for property. Or if so that actually helps us because property wildlife. in the state of Pennsylvania is 48 hours. If something's in your property within 48 hours, it's yours. That applies to cats in our right. case. We, we make the law fit, mm -hmm. so that also applies to cats. But there's not actually a law protecting them. So okay. that's the stuff I want to work on, actually getting stuff in place to, to have it happen. So advocacy for cats yeah. in Pennsylvania. Well, I can tell you we can use it too because you know, cats are seen as domestic animals, but there are some people who like to shoot the ferals, yeah. you know, and, um, and, and the, the bills that we've done, you know, like, as an example, the Companion Animal Capital Fund is specific to Article 7 shelters, okay, and that Article 7 Ag and Markets Law details what the shelters are. So we've got a couple of shelters that only deal with cats, they're not eligible. Mm -hmm. for this money. One, part of the ch language changes that we're going for in the, in the bill for next year, we almost had it done this year and then all, everything blew up, but one of the things is to change that, to change the Article 7 designation and to make it easier for shelters that don't have municipal contracts to have access to this money. Because right now this money, if you have one municipal contract, you can get up to 250 if you have two or more, you can get up to five hundred thousand, um, and 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 then if there's any money left over, a non-municipal shelter can get up to fifty thousand dollars. But the idea of anything left over is laughable, right? right. right? Um, well, I think that's our challenge with the municipal contracts is what we've been running into because we're trying to change things because they weren't paying for anything. Right. And it's like the, what comes back in our face is, well, we don't have to deal with cats. We only have to deal with dogs. dogs. We don't have to deal with all dogs. We just have to deal with vicious dogs. And we don't have to deal, you know, and it's just like, but the cats are two, three fourths of our intake. So, and the problem that we're having. So it's just like, you can't do your animal control contracts based off of only dog needs, which are dwindling every single year as far as the need and yet cats are continuing to grow and it's just like that's the battle that we're in right now because the municipalities are like well we don't have to care about that right so and I'm like, I need you to care about that. so it's about <laughs> you know you, you're looking at changing the state laws to deal with cats to make them seem as as important as dogs but also educating your local elected officials that's about it about and that's because they don't see the bigger picture of yeah. if you take control and actually spay and neuter the feral cats they become less feral cats and they're less your problem but they don't because, right. because there's no laws because there's no right. anything it's nobody's problem right now. so so one of the things you can do to deal with your local yokels okay <laughs> is to do what I call power mapping they you put them in the middle of a piece of paper and you figure out who you know that knows them or even a second degree out who golfs with them who you know who does the wife or the husband hang out with who the drinking buddies are that agree with you on this issue and have them go 
and, and deliver your message as well. They're going to expect the message to come from you. Right. They're not going to expect the message to come from the head of Rotary or the hospital administrator or their golfing buddy. Well, it's always the crazy cat lady that the message right. comes from, and nobody right. wants to listen. I mean, That's it's right. True. It's true. Like it's you true. Have, you know, not to, I, I'm a crazy cat lady, but you know, it's like if you act like a crazy cat lady, they're going to be like, <laughs> yeah, right, go away. Yeah. You're bothering me. So, yeah. you know, it's about building, you know, on a local level, building that advocacy base of people that you can draw on to do things. And, and part of it is getting people they know who they respect to talk to them about these issues so that it seems like, oh, this is a real issue, this is important, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as well as making sure you've got people, just regular old people who are willing to come to the city council meetings, come um, you know, and do a lobby visit, write them letters. I can tell you this, local, local elected officials flip out when they start getting emails on an issue because nobody talks to them about anything except maybe a pothole. That's it, right? So they flip out when they start getting ish, um, emails about these things. And if you are a member of the Fed, I can set up our email thing that goes to the state officials to go to your elected officials, your local elected officials, so that you can do some organizing locally on an issue if you need to, if you need some, some change being done. So, I mean, if we didn't win that night in Norwich, that's where we, that was our next thing to do. Um, and so it's important to, to get, you know, your people organized and get your supporters. So you've got volunteers, you have donors, right? Those are your two core bases. And you have your boards, okay? Your boards need to be engaged in advocacy as well. They need to understand the importance of advocacy and how it will help the shelter do its job. Okay, yes dear? Um, we have been fighting for three years, uh, or more really, to get county funding, mm -hmm. um, and we're pretty close, but are we allowed to um, do an email blast to our supporters and say, here's the email addresses for the county board members, send them an email? You can send that, all that information to me and I'll do it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 But yes, you are, because you can use up to 20% of your budget, okay. but we need to set it up on the back end in okay. order to do that. Okay. But yes. Yeah, I think a big thing for us, especially with the uh, main law enforcement in our building, is we see a lot of animal cruelty. And uh, we go out with our officers and we realize the things that they're facing. So a lot of these calls that we're getting, they can't enforce anything. And then the neighbors or whoever's in that neighborhood get really frustrated that laws do not support their concerns or their property, and they feel very much trapped. And the laws seem to be incredibly outdated. Uh, I know we're currently working on a, a sheltering law, you know, so there's some way to actually make something quantitative when you come to the house. It's, oh, there's, there's hay in that. Right, that the outdoor. Enclosure. Right. Uh, and that's appropriate. So. Um, I think it's finding different ways, not only that we can uh, make people kind of be responsible for their actions and also uh, be accountable to them, and then when they almost come in, we have some recourse. And it doesn't take a very long time to make that process happen. Well, the animals are sitting in our shelter waiting, essentially, for an outcome. And you can do something on the local level about that from a county perspective a lot e more easily than you will at the state level. And the reason for that is now with both houses of, of, of government, the legislature in democratic hands, they are loath to increase penalties for anything because it means putting more men of color in jail and they don't want to do that. And so, and that's, that's their perspective. Increasing penalties for anything equals that. Whether or not the guy who is abusing the animals, leaving outside is a farmer in upstate New York and it's a white guy, it doesn't really matter. But that's a perspective that we have now, and we've always had that in the assembly. That's why it's been impossible to increase penalties for anything. Um, and so we have to look at the local level to not, they're not going to throw people in jail, but to just make an ordinance, this is what you have to do. This is how you have to treat your animals. This is how the enclosure you have to provide, blah, 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 blah. Otherwise, you'll get a ticket, or you'll get this, or you'll get that. You know, you're not going to throw them in jail. It's the speed, too. I mean, we've had certain animals in our shelter now for well over a year, and we cannot seem to get this just to go. Um, in the meantime, these animals 
are probably not better off. No, they're not. Uh, and either they should have been euthanized well a long time ago, and I'm talking about fighting animals. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, these are chickens, but, or roosters. And you go, and are we really doing the best thing by these animals um, in this circumstance? And then why is it taking us so long to resolve this? Let's get ownership of these animals, figure out what we need to do, and if we can get them home, to them home. In the meantime, figure everything else out. But right. These guys are still waiting. Yeah, because the people haven't, hasn't haven't signed them over to you yep. right yeah. right well and, you know it's the 48 hour um property thing in pennsylvania sounds yeah. sort of good <laughs> yeah right it, it, depends on, it depends on the community yeah, yeah. Well, and they also didn't intend it to be that way we just yeah you just you yeah well that's the way you, you know you use the law for how you can yeah. use the law you get things well, done and because property is defined by proven property you have to so say you have an irresponsible cat owner that doesn't take their cat to the vet they also then can't prove property either. So that's our benefit. Yes, it's question <laughs> and answer time. So um, when we were talking about killing bad bills, okay, that, that, that this is something that's haunted me forever because I made it, I'm sure, in a, a political en enemy because he found a, a local, he wanted to have a local law to have a pet offenders registry mm -hmm. because, oh my God, people, on the first blush, think that is marvelous, right. but really, who it, it it really harms mentally ill people. It is extremely expensive for a shelter to check every person to see if they show up on the registry. You know, blah blah blah. And I wouldn't support the bill. And he kept trying to get it to go through, and because it was going to make such good press for him. What do you do in a situation like that when it's clearly something that looks good at first blush but it's terrible so the question is what do you do when uh, a bill looks good but it really is looks underlying good to the public. looks good to the public but underlying is is terrible one of the things that i say about this particular issue yeah. is what kind of resources is the county going to put behind it because if they don't put the same, because we have the state registry bill too. My thing is, if you don't put the same resources behind it as you do the child abuse registry, it's not going to do anything. Not a thing. So what's the county, how much money is the county going to do? It, it, that particular bill, if we didn't do, find the SPCA a thousand dollars for every person they didn't check. Well, that's oh. where you go and you organize your people and for them to come to the county legislature meeting and speak out against well, it. Killed, yeah, but right. I made an enemy. Right. You know? Well, th you know, sometimes that's what happens. And that was the legislature? It was the county legislature. Yeah. Now it's state. Oh, boy. Oh, you'll have to tell me later. <laughs> um, but sometimes you are going to make an enemy. Sometimes it's not going to be all, you know, doves and chocolate you know puppies I mean and right that sometimes it's just not going to be all puppies and kittens it's just this is politics and this is hardball politics even if it's on the local level these people play hardball they want what they want they want it when they want it and you know logic be damned okay but one of the things that can be done is to make sure your messaging or the messaging you need to get out there is is strong and I would strongly suggest that you craft your messaging around values and emotion. Love, hate, fear, and hope. Those are the four emotions. We are all about love and hope. And who do we need leave love, uh, fear, and hate to? The politicians, OK? Because that's what they trade in. But we're all about love and hope. And we're all about the values. The value, and I'm not talking about free anything values but the values of compassion and commitment to community and those kinds of things. You know, you might want to actually, you know, before you even start any kind of advocacy process, do a focus group and, or, or a series of focus groups and ask people or do a survey monkey, what values does the shelter represent to the community? What are those emotional responses that people get? And use that because emotion drives people. LBJ said, capture their hearts and their minds will follow. He has also had some very other colorful things to say, but that was one of those things that he, he did say. So I'm going to wrap it up because I guess we only have an hour, right? So you can become an advocate. You can go to, um, you can go to that one website or you can just go to our regular site, which is nysapf.org.
with all these cute little animals, and I update it every so often. I have to do some updating because I've just been crazed. And click on Action Center, and it goes to that place where you saw before. Sign up for our action alerts. It goes right to that page. Okay? So nysapf.org. Remember, do the opt-in. If you are an ACO or a DCO or a Humane Law Enforcement Peace Officer, or you know people or you, know, you have them, have them contact us so that they can be become part of the Division of Animal Cruelty Law Enforcement so that we can do more legislative action around their needs um, on, a, on a legislative basis. The legislature is off now. They ended their session one day late. They wanted to end on the 19th. They ended on the 20th of June, which means they're in district. You have an issue, go talk to them. You know, go talk to them about, about the pet sales ban. What about lame ducks or those that you, you know are no, are not going to run again? Then uh, what you need to do, time. it's a waste of time, and you need to start paying attention about who is running and go to talk to them, both sides of the aisle, okay. about your issues okay. so that they embrace them. You're not making an endorsement. Mm -hmm. You're just talking to them and giving them information. Okay? okay? And, you know, in New, in New York, we're going to see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for coming.